That's what I earned having spent 20 years on the street every single day in violation of both God's laws and the laws of man. But God had a different plan and a purpose for my life. And that's what got me through it because the bell rang and I finally turned towards him instead of away from him. And then things started to work out. Welcome to the Christian Channel. I'm your host, Yanitza Munoz. Today we have a very special guest, Michael Francis. Thank you so very much for taking the time to be on the show today. Well, thanks for having me. So for many who aren't aware, Michael Francis is a public speaker and also an entrepreneur and philanthropist. But before then, he was part of uh, the mob, the Colombo family mob. And for anyone who is not familiar with your story, give us a little bit of a of a background about your past and how you have now transitioned into a man of Christ. Yeah, well, my dad was the uh, underboss of the Colombo crime family, one of the five New York uh, mafia Cosa Nostra families. And so I grew up in that life. Uh, grew up in Brooklyn, later on moved to Long Island, New York. And um, initially my dad didn't want me as part of that life. He wanted me to go to school and be a doctor, but my dad was an extremely high profile figure at that time, major target of law enforcement. So we had, um, he was under investigation constantly. We had law enforcement around us constantly. I grew up hating the police, hating the government, uh, mainly because my dad was my idol. I loved him and I always saw the police and law enforcement as harassing my father and my family. So I grew up in that environment. And my dad, you know, went to trial three times during my childhood. He was in and out of jail during that time. And the three trials he, w he went on originally, he was acquitted and found not guilty. But then in 1966, my dad was indicted on a major federal case for masterminding a nationwide string of bank robberies. He goes to trial, gets convicted. 1967, they sentenced him to 50 years in prison. It was like the longest sentence for a bank robbery conspiracy case ever given up to that point. 1970, he goes away uh, to start doing his time. He lost all his appeals. And I was a pre-med student at uh, Hofstra University at the time. I was devastated when my dad went in. And then Joe Colombo, who was the boss of the family, obviously knew the family well. He kind of took me under his wing. And to make a very long story short, I lost interest in school, wanted to help my dad get out of prison because I believed he was innocent. And um, at a meeting I had with my father in uh, Leavenworth Penitentiary in the visiting room, he uh, proposed me for membership into the Colombo family. I was 20 years old and that's how it started for me. Remember when banks were the cornerstone of our communities, upholding our values and supporting our way of life? Today, many banks have strayed from those principles, but there's a better choice. For over 65 years, America's Christian Credit Union has been dedicated to serving faith-filled Americans with integrity and devotion. Make the switch to America's Christian Credit Union and enjoy great rates, cutting edge mobile banking, access to over 5,000 shared branches and 30,000 ATMs nationwide. Switching banks may seem daunting, but consider what big corporate banks are doing with your deposits. America's Christian Credit Union was founded by a pastor for the benefit of its members, ensuring your money aligns with your values. Plus, Christian Channel listeners can get an additional $100 bonus with the promo code CC2024 at checkout. Why settle for banks that don't share your values? Faith-based aligned banking is within reach. Make the switch to America's Christian Credit Union today. Terms and restrictions do apply. Visit americaschristiancu.com slash cc2024 for complete program details and to get started. America's Christian Credit Union is federally insured by the NCUA. And your father was a Sonny Francis and he, um, you know, wanted you to be part of the family business. You originally wanted to go to medical school, correct? Yes. So it was something very different than what he initially wanted for you. And your story is so unique because, you know, working in that environment, it's it, you're risking your life. You're 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 doing deals with people um, that could potentially harm you. So you're always kind of like looking over your shoulder. With that being said, were there ever times where where you definitely looked? 
for your faith deep within just to kind of go along with your daily life? Well, not really. You know, I grew up as a Catholic. I mean, Catholic school from kindergarten right through high school. I was an altar boy the whole bit. But for me, for some reason, Catholicism was more like a subject in school. I didn't understand till later on when I became a Christian that uh, our life is really about a relationship with Jesus. And I didn't get that, you know, early on. So throughout my 20 years in that life in the mob, I didn't really look to God. And, and you know, I can't explain why other than, like I said, I didn't have that relationship. So um, do you live in constant fear? No, but you're constantly on your guard for making a mistake that you can suffer severe consequences for. So you got to play by the rules and, and, you know, obey the policies. But, you know, I had, I had a two-tier problem because I became a major target of law enforcement myself. I mean, I was arrested 18 times. I was indicted seven times. I had two federal racketeering cases, one state. You know, immediately I had my father's name on me. So, I mean, they started on me right away. I went to trial five times. So I was, you know, always concerned about both sides, had to play it right. So it was kind of turbulent, but you know, listen, I was a real student of the life. I wanted to be the best possible mob guy I could be. I had a lot of success in that life uh, until things changed. Feeling run down? Imagine if a simple sip of pure water could rejuvenate both your body and spirit. Introducing Renewal Rain, the sparkling water designed to do more than just quench your thirst because it's your daily boost for a refreshed body and a renewed soul. Infused with natural flavors and a touch of faith, Renewal Rain isn't just about hydration. It's about finding joy and inspiration in every drop, reminding you of a deeper renewal we all seek. Inspired by Ephesians 4 24, which encourages us to put off with the old self and put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Renewal Rain helps you embrace a fresh start every day. Elevate your refreshment routine, grab Renewal Rain today, and experience the transformation. Visit RenewalRain.com to learn more and order your first can today. Use promo code ChristianChannel15 for special offers. Well, like I mentioned earlier, your story is, is unique from people that have not a normal nine to five. You could have been that that doctor working in your special practice, whichever uh, specialty you would have chosen, and go home to your family. But you, your, your life path went into the family business, and you were around a lot of um, different type of, of entrepreneurship. And it's so interesting, too, because you speak about it in a lot of your books. Now you have three books, correct? I have five, actually. Five now, now. Yes. wow. yeah. And out of all your books, which one is the one that directly speaks more about uh, maybe the, the issues that you went through in the 80s? Well, really my book, Blood Covenant, which is my autobiography, um, and then a book uh, that I wrote, God the Father, which is really a ministry tool. It's, it's I really put my heart in that book and tried to give people encouragement that are going through some challenges and struggles and how you know my turning toward Jesus was you know life-changing for me. And I've given many of those books out in prisons and, and so on and so forth. But um, and my book, Blood Covenant, which really tells the whole story. It's been a fascinating ride, I guess, in some ways. You know, when it's your own life, you, you don't look back and say, wow, look at everything that happened. But other people see it that way. You know, it's your life. You're just living your life. Well, they've made movies with uh, your character in it. Yes. Out of uh, a few of the movies, were there anyone that, that you thought was close to playing you? Or was it just all kind of like overdone Hollywood scripts? Well, it was really good fellas that, you know, they mentioned me in, which I was a little surprised because that was a different family, even though I knew all of those guys well, Henry Hill and Jimmy Burke. Uh, but they put me in there because I had some name value and they knew I knew those guys. It wasn't a major, major part, but um, they're, they're developing a movie on my life now, which I think will go into production next year. So that is really the life story based upon the book. You know, for about 20 years, they've been trying to make a movie on me, but they never wanted to tell the faith side. They mm -hmm. always wanted to make a real gangster movie, and I said, I'm not into that. If you don't tell the whole story, then why do the movie? So, but this group, um, you know, they thought the, the transition or transformation was the important part of the film. So I'm, I'm excited about it. I think they're doing a good job. I love that they're going to incorporate your true personality and you're also 
get to have a say in that and you actually mm-hmm. got, get to say that you would like the Christian, um, your Christian influence involved because later on after you met your wife, correct, is when you got closer yes. to God. Yeah, my wife, I met her on a movie set. You know, I was at the height of my career in that life mm-hmm. and uh, I was filming a movie. Among many things I was doing, I had a production company and she was one of the dancers in the film. She was 19 years old and I was 31 and um, immediately attracted to her. And you know, the funny thing is she was Mexican. You know, back in New York, we didn't have any Mexicans. Most I never Puerto even- Puerto Ricans or Cubans. Yeah, I mean, I never even ate a burrito before I met my wife. I didn't know what it was, but um, you know, I fell in love with her. She was a strong woman of faith, even at that age. Her mother, my mother-in-law, future mother-in-law, was the most godly woman I ever met in my life. You know, she had a prayer book that she put my name in and was praying for me daily. So they had a powerful influence on me and I started thinking that way, but it really wasn't until I had my own experience with the Lord that kind of cemented it for me. And what was that exact experience? Maybe it was seeing the, the other opportunities that he was placing in front of you, maybe meeting your wife? What what were the exact experiences? Well, as a result of meeting my wife, you know, one of the horrors of the mob life is that every family that I know who is of a made man, which is what I was, uh, has been totally devastated, including my own. Now, not my wife and kids, but my mother spent 33, my, my dad did 40 years in prison out of that 50. My mother spent 33 years without a husband Before she passed away in 2012, I can only describe her relationship with my dad as ugly Mm. because she blamed him for everything that went wrong, and rightfully so. And so what went wrong? I had a sister. My baby sister uh, died at 27 years old, overdose of drugs. My brother, my younger brother, I was the oldest, uh, 25 years a drug addict. And I can't even begin to tell you what I had to do just to keep him alive. Mm. If If he wasn't my brother or my father's son, he'd have been dead you know, with all the trouble he was in. So uh, 25 years, my younger sister, another one, she wasn't mentally stable. She died at 40 years old. So my whole family was devastated. And that's true of every family, of every member of that life that I know. So I I meet this young girl. I fall in love with her. I said, am I going to do the same thing to her? It doesn't make sense. So I had to make a choice. It was either life or her. And I chose her. Now, that's not an easy choice because you can't walk away from that life. So I had many challenges ahead of me to try to separate myself without cooperating with the government, entering witness protection program, testifying against everybody. I didn't want to hurt anybody. So I had to walk a very fine line. And as a result, what I did is I took a plea to a big racketeering case. Tax fraud was the underlying act. I got a 10-year prison sentence. I had $15 million in restitution. I had a lot of, I had a plane, I had a helicopter, I had, you know, houses in various places. So I gave that all to the government as part of my forfeiture. I married Camille in July of 85, and I go to prison in December of 85. So we were only married like, you know, three or four months, and she was 20 years old, 21 years old. So she had a lot of struggles to go through uh, herself. I did eight years in that prison. Um, But I had, uh, I did five years, came out on parole, and then after 13 months on parole with people trying to hurt me, it was, it was a very difficult time because everybody was upset with me. My father practically disowned me because I walked away from the life. Mm-hmm. Uh, boss of my family, contract on my life because you couldn't walk away. So I had a very rough time. And then the government was all over me. They wanted me to become a witness. They said, you're a dead man anyway. Cooperate with us. I didn't want to do that. So... Then, like a fool, and I'm the first to admit it, I fall into a trap, violate my parole, and they put me back in prison for another three years, and they put me in solitary for the whole time. Uh, it really is a way to get even with me. And but maybe was, the solitary might have saved you if there was a hit maybe in prison. Well, there's no question. Mm-hmm. No question, because all of the people that were angry with me during my time in the hole all either died or went to prison. So when I came out, this I got violated in 91, I came out in 95, and uh, just about everybody was gone. Mm-hmm. But it was during that time in the hole, that uh, in solitary, that I, I really found the Lord. Well, I'm happy that you were able to um, have that time to really reflect. And also, it's obvious that God was giving you a second chance. You met your beautiful wife, 
and she also obviously loved you so much to um having to not see you for five years and well visiting is one thing but not being with you 24 7 right? right um so i do feel like it was god showing you that your next chapter in your life is going to be better and better for you. Well, there's no question, you know, when God has a plan and a purpose for you, you still may go through struggles. That time in solitary probably saved my life. And it was during that time I read my Bible every single day. And, you know, I, I did it a little bit differently because I wasn't so willing to buy into it right away because I actually challenged God during that time. I said, God, look, you know, I, I took a blood oath you know, and I was very dedicated to that life. Look where it got me. I may spend the rest of my life in prison. I said, I followed my father. I love my father. I followed him blindly, and look where I am. I said, I can't do this again. You know, if you really are God, if this Bible is written by men, inspired by you, the blueprint for our life, that's how I look at Scripture. I said, well, you, you know, you got to show me the evidence. you got to prove this to me because I can't do this again. Eternity, if there is one, is too important. And so I studied the Bible uh, with that in mind, looking for evidence. I had my wife send me in books on every faith. And I had a Sony Walkman. I used to listen to Pastor Greg Laurie, who is now a dear friend for 20 years. And he helped me interpret scripture. And I, I came out of there almost, I mean, I went through this almost trying to disprove mm. Christianity. But I came out of there believing it 100%. And, you know, I say this all the time. I'm not the best Christian. You know, there's a saying, you can take the boy out of Brooklyn. You can't always take mm -hmm. Brooklyn out of the boy. So I have my issues, but my faith is rock solid. I, I would not believe in anything else because of all the work and research and study I've done. I've seen what God has done in my life. And I've seen what he's done in the lives of others that even put my testimony to pale. I mean, mm -hmm. God is really there and working in people's lives. Yes, and what you've been through, um, being able to get out of prison, be with your family, and having this next chapter in life is a true miracle. What I also love is the fact that you are giving back. You're a public speaker. You have events that you speak to millions of people about how to get their life back in whatever way that, I know everyone has their own path and their own journey or their own trauma, but you use yours as a way that somehow they can see the struggles that you went through and how you overcame them. And so I want to applaud you for that. Thank so you. on your website, correct, you're always listing different uh, events that you have yeah. coming up in the near future. So for a lot of our listeners, you can go to his website, which is michaelfrancis.com. Yes. And you can see a lot of his upcoming events and also his five books. So with so much that you've been through, um, you've been arrested many times and you had to finally serve your time in prison, um, coming out in prison, coming out of prison, when was the turning point where you decided to become a public speaker and write all these books? Was it something that your wife maybe decided for you to do or are you just wanting to tell your story versus all these Hollywood uh, writers create stories about you without you having a say in it? No, it was actually none of that. When I, uh, If you would have said to me when I walked out of prison I'd be public speaking, I would have said, you're crazy. I never even thought, it wasn't even a thought in my mind. My thought was, how do I get my life back in order? Mm -hmm. You know, moving out of New York, now being out in California, starting all over again, basically. Uh, I never even gave it a thought, but two things happened. Number one, all the pro leagues, uh, Major League Baseball, the NBA, NFL, NHL, they approached me when I was in prison because I had a big gambling operation on the street, and we had athletes gambling with us. And they said, basically, Michael, you've turned your life around. Would you... Uh, tell us how you set up these athletes, the dangers of gambling. And I said, okay. And they shot a video while I was in prison. And um, they all chipped in like a quarter of a million bucks. And when I got out, they said, this video is really having an impact. Would you come and speak to our players? So I started speaking to all the pro sports leagues. And at the same time, the pastor of my church who married me, and I only met him like two or three times, but... He was sending me books in prison. He was sending me money for commissary. Such a nice guy. So when I got out, he said, would you come to the church and give your testimony? And when he said testimony, I said, what is he talking about? I thought you did that from a witness stand. I didn't <laughs> even know what he was talking about. But I couldn't turn him down. So um, I went and just told my story to the congregation. And then all of a sudden, I started getting, you know, uh, reached out from other pastors and other ministries. The word kind of spread. That's how it started. I never planned it. It wasn't even in, in any way, shape, or form in my mind. 
but that was God's plan for my life. So, you know, he doesn't always give you the blueprint. Exactly. Yeah. And I love that you're, you're willing and open to it as well. What I also love is that when you do speak with other people, they also give their testimony and how inspired they are by you. Mm -hmm. My next question is, what advice do you give to people who are involved in gangs today? Being in Southern California, you know, we have the Bloods and the Crips. Um, mm -hmm. In other states, they have their other issues with gangs. And a lot of these gang members, they're young. Some of them are even 14 years old, 15. Some are in their 20s. Um, they're highly influenced by music or the area that they live in, and that's just all they know. What advice do you give them to maybe change their life or if they're thinking about changing their life? You know, I speak to youth and gangbangers all the time. It's part of what I do. I go into detention centers, juvenile halls. And uh, one thing that really hit me, and this was, this was terrible, I was speaking in New Jersey at a juvenile hall. And after I was done, and you know, they listen to me because they look at the mafia as the biggest gang in the world. And so I have a lot of credibility when I talk to them. They listen. And I'm giving out my books afterwards, and they were coming over to me one at a time, and I was signing them. And this little kid comes up to me. I looked at him and I said, how old are you? And he said, I'm 12. And I said, 12 years old. He said, yeah. I said, what did you do? And he kind of went like this. And I said, excuse me, when somebody's asking you a question, you look them in the eye and you answer. And he looked at me and he goes, just like this, I killed somebody. And I got into his story a little bit. And a lot of these gangbangers, what they're doing is they recruit these younger kids to do their work. Kids come off the street fatherless home, no father figure, mom trying to do her best, whatever. Uh, and they gravitate to the local gangbanger drug dealer, start doing their bidding because they, they're tried as young people and they have to be released at the age of 25. By that time, they're already indoctrinated in prison, the whole thing. So, and I met so many of them when I was in prison. And I tell them straight out, the gang life, the mob life, dead end street, you can't beat these people. And I tell them, listen, there's two things that you have to be concerned with in life. If you want to have some segment of success, number one, you are who you hang out with. You hang with the wrong crowd. You're going to be known to be the wrong type of person. And of course, they're going to influence you. You got to surround yourself with good people. I mean, I was very fortunate. My wife, a very independent woman. She doesn't take any nonsense. You know, she had her time with me. Now I got to go straight. I'm responsible to my wife, my kids, my God. And secondly, who you are accountable to in life is going to direct the path that you're on. Accountability is everything. When I was on the street, I was accountable to my oath, to my boss, so I was a criminal. Now I'm accountable to my God first, my wife, my children, people that rely on me, that expect me to do the right thing. So I have that balance and that check on my life. So I told them who you're accountable to and who you hang out with. You've got to get that right and stay away from the gang life because you're going to go down. Nobody beats that life. Nobody. It eventually is going to catch up with you. You end up prison or you're going to end up dead. One of the two. And it, it resonates. I believe with all my heart that the, the problems that we're having with our young people is the breakup of the family. You need to have a family unit. I mean, it's biblical. It's what God intended. And when you have kids that don't have a proper mentor in the home, they have young moms having babies that don't even know how to take care of themselves yet. And you have all these young people that are like, they just don't have any guidance. And it's very sad. It's really sad. It's not something that, you, you know, it's very sad. And, you know, I tell adults, we have a re responsibility to these young people because we created the environment that they're living in. And we have to get it right with them. And obviously, I steer everybody to the Lord because I don't know how you get past things without believing in the Lord and having, having him have your back. Mm -hmm. And that's what's got me through it. Look, I should either be dead or in prison for the rest of my life. And quite honestly, I tell people, that's what I deserved. That's what I earned, having spent 20 years on the street every single day in violation of both God's laws and the laws of man. But God had a different plan and a purpose for my life. And that's what got me through it because the bell rang and I finally turned towards him instead of away from him. And then things started to work out. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a lot of work to do um, really to straighten out our youth. And um, if we don't do it, we're just going to see a, a continuous decline. I agree. And I think it's great that you're speaking with a lot of millennials. I'm a millennial. So we're, this is the age of like the, those who are getting married, family planning. And unfortunately, um, 
our generation is, can either has kids already and they're going through issues, maybe contemplating divorce, or they're deciding to have kids, or they probably don't want to, or they don't want to get married. And and I understand everyone; it's it's your life, not forced upon anyone. But I think it's bigger in the sense of they have um, unhealed trauma, or maybe they need to seek proper counseling, or maybe as a child they lacked uh, some type of guidance. But when when you're able to speak to the youth that is struggling, I hope that they see what you're saying and see the bigger picture that it is actually better to have um, a loving household, um, proper communication with their loved ones, whether it's their wife, husband, or their kids, and to keep that family unity and circling that back to God. Because when you are a spiritual person and you have faith, there's usually more good comes out of it than bad. But when you aren't around that, usually have more anxiety, have more depression, have more confusion. But when you are a person of faith, there is more of like a meditative ease, a peace to it as well. A millennial myself, I'm seeing this next generation coming. I think it's Gen Z, I believe. <laughs> I should know That's this. What they call it, but yeah. but I really hope that they're able to also see the peace and the love in being a spiritual person and being a Christian because there's this world is is hard, it's tough. Life is not easy, but when you have faith, you just see things a little bit clearer. Absolutely, you know, and, and our leadership, unfortunately now, you know, trying to push God out of our institutions is just insanity. You know, and, and a good statistic, um, I spoke to um, the Senate staff um, a couple of years back on the anniversary of 9-11. There was a lot of senators involved. We talked about prison reform. And I said, you know, one of the, one of the uh, faults you have in prison, when I was in the, in, in the system, inmates that were in Christian programs and were discipled inside the prison and outside the prison, this is the stat. The recidivism rate in the Bureau of Prisons, Federal Bureau of Prisons, is about 65%. You repeat offenders, 65%. Those that went through a Christian discipleship program, the recidivism rate goes down to 5%. Wow, it's impressive. Because they have God. Yeah, it's a mm -hmm. huge, huge, huge difference. So I said, why would you not want these programs? If you really care about your constituents and your communities, why wouldn't you want a Christian program in the prison that's going to help these people come out and not commit crimes again and not wreak havoc in the neighborhoods? It makes no sense. You can't push God out of our lives and expect a good result. And unfortunately, it's happening here in the United States, and we're suffering for it. And we're going to continue to suffer for it until people come to their senses. Mm -hmm. I think it's a lot of pandering to minority groups, you know, and I don't, I don't fully understand that because basically I think the people in America, uh, many of them have a good moral compass and are God-fearing, God-loving people. But we don't shout and scream the loudest, you know, that's it. And so um, our public officials pander to those that shout the loudest, even though they're the minorities. And, but it's having a dramatic and harmful effect, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know how to clear it all up other than to continue to try to be an encouragement and lead people in the right direction, and hopefully the tide will turn. Yes. Well, that's what we do here at the Christian Channel. We're all about making positive Christian content. And I agree with your saying there's so much uh, backlash and hate towards Christians, and it shouldn't be that way. And I think... It, hopefully, I see it getting a little bit better. I'm Mexican and I grew up Catholic and I'm a proud Christian, but at the same time, I feel that uh, there's more atheists, unfortunately, but at this, I also see some people coming back to God because of an extreme situation or maybe because they saw how their life is getting better when they follow Jesus' steps in the sense of, of being a good person, loving, and also we have to remember that he died on the cross for our sins and we're not perfect people, but he did so much to, to save us. And I just hope our content, even you speaking about this right now, brings people back to the church. And there's also a lot of Christians who are spiritual, but maybe they fall away from it from trauma. Mm -hmm. And that's a real reality of this world. And if anyone is experiencing any trauma for so many you know, different types of traumas out there, seek counseling, seek someone to speak to. Going back to what you said, you know, sometimes kids they get lost because of issues that have happened and they don't have anyone to look up to. Maybe they don't have a parent, you know, a mother or a father. They go to the streets, they get into gangs and 
like you mentioned, there's nothing more from that. They might not even live to be 30. No, which is very it's, unfortunate. It's a tough situation, you know. And look, the church that I belong to, Harvest, Pastor Greg Glory, the good that we do, you know, throughout the not only the community but throughout the world in many places. Beautiful. I don't see other other you know organizations doing what we do. I mean, we give to the poor, we give to the community. You know, we bring people in, we teach them the right the right word. Pastor Greg Glory is amazing in that regard, and his whole staff and the church. And um, I don't know why they would want to push us out, other than that they have an alternative way of thinking and mm -hmm. living um, that doesn't lead to anything good. And, you know, listen, to me, it's all about Jesus, and it's all about moving towards him and not away from him. And um, my life is a testament to that. So hopefully, again, you know, we use our platforms to encourage people. Not, to, You know, when I say this, I'm not trying to turn anybody into a Christian. I'm not trying to force my faith on you, but we are obligated to share. You mm -hmm. know, Jesus' last command, Mark 16, 15, go out and preach or share the good word with mm -hmm. all the creation. So we're all obligated to do that. Mm -hmm. What they do with it at that point is up to them. But our obligation is to plant seeds. And I believe if we plant enough seeds in the right way, uh, lovingly, you know, not, not judgmentally, not forcefully, not judging. forcefully mm -hmm. um, that God will do the rest. Amen. So I know your faith has influenced a lot of your, your kids. Your wife is already uh, was a Christian, and she has influenced you. So how has your faith influenced relationship with your father? I know your father um, has passed already, but he lived to almost be 100 years old. And you actually picked him up when he was released from prison. He was actually 103 when oh, he passed Oh, 103, away. that's he, right. He was 100 when he was released from prison. He was the oldest inmate in the system at the time of his release. You know, one of the re regrets, or maybe a little guilt, you might call it that, that I have is, I don't think I ministered enough to my dad. It was just difficult. You know, he's old school. And, and it was a different life he was living compared to yeah. what you have changed your life to be. And I don't think my dad wanted to let his guard down that much with me, but... You know, from the moment I became a Christian and started speaking, I've literally, at every event and every opportunity I've had, I've had people praying for my dad, pray for my father, pray for my father, millions of people praying for him over the 20 years. And uh, I believe God is faithful in that regard. I did send a chaplain in to see my dad, um, and she, who was a wonderful woman, told me that she spent three hours with him read the Bible, and he accepted Christ during that time. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, now I didn't see a lot of evidence of that, but that doesn't matter, you know. Um, so maybe, you know, listen, the one thing that people need to understand, I always look at the thief on the cross. For some reason, hanging on the cross next to Jesus, he saw something in Jesus. And he looked at him and he said, you know, remember me today in your kingdom. And it's so inspiring when Jesus looked at him, saw that his heart was sincere, because you can't pull a scam on God. He knows our hearts. Mm -hmm. And he said, today you'll be with me in paradise. So I believe, you know, the Romans didn't put you on a cross for stealing. He was probably a murderer. He was probably, a, you know, an insurrectionist, probably did some bad stuff. Jesus forgot that in one second. So it's so uplifting to know the kind of Lord that we serve. And it's never, ever, ever too late to turn towards him. So, and that's what I tell people. Mm -hmm. Don't tell me, you know, you've spent 60 years of your life as a bad guy. It's time to turn it around right mm -hmm. now. That's God. There have been many films that they have actors playing you. And now you mentioned that there's gonna be a movie being created specifically about you. Mm -hmm. Now, have you selected the actor to play you or do you have a say in who to play for you? And is there a specific actor you would like them to choose? Well, it's a big company, and um, they have access to major talent, and they're mentioning big names. You know, they're talking DiCaprio and Robert Downey Jr. and, and uh, I'm DiCaprio not, would be pretty cool. <laughs> it'd be pretty cool. I know that that would be complicated because he probably has so much going on. You know, who knows mm -hmm. when you can get a film done with him? But um, I think the script is going to be very attractive to a major star. Um, not only for my role, but for my dad's role, he's going to be prominent, and my wife. So there are three characters that are going to be meaningful. Um, you know, I really, I really don't care. Uh, you know, I said whatever gets the movie made, and I'm sure whoever they select is going to be, you know, uh, going to play the part 
probably better than I'd play it my, my, myself, but better than I am myself, I should say. But I'm just uh, I'm enthusiastic about it being done and the way they're doing it, they're telling the story. So hopefully, again, I mean, people are going to be very entertained. I mean, it is a mob story, but I think the transformation is going to be meaningful the way they're writing it and the way it happened. So uh, we'll see. You know, it's, it's Hollywood and crazy things happen there, but uh, it's looking good. Yes, and as you mentioned earlier in our interview, that they're going to incorporate the faith in there and how you yeah. transition to being a born-again Christian, which I think is beautiful because, unfortunately, I feel like Hollywood films in the past always kind of leave Christ out of it, but now mm -hmm. I see more people really like the Christian content because they see that the need for it, especially in this crazy times we're in with the elections around the corner, a lot of uh, our country's divided. There's a lot of hate, unfortunately. And the only way you can end hate is stop fueling it. And when you fuel the love, then you see that everyone is more understanding and just understanding that this world, we're all in it together. So I really like that they're going to incorporate that in their film. Yeah, and the good thing lately, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's been some good Christian films yes. with a Christian theme. I mean, you don't like to call them Christian films. They're just good films. The faith is part of it. You know, Jesus Revolution, which was uh, Greg Laurie's life story, uh, has done extremely well at the box office, and a number of them have, and that's what makes Hollywood tick. You know, if you're doing well at the box office, uh, I don't think they care at that point what the, you know, what the message is in the film. So, you know, that's that's moving in the right direction. So I think we're going to see more good faith-based films come into play. I know there's a few in production now that are, are exciting. So, you know, hopefully mine will be included in that. Yes, and also with Podcast 2 I know here on the Christian channel, we're faith-based, we're positive content. Mm -hmm. I have also seen other uh, podcasts also, you know, producing more Christian-based. So I do see the light at the end of the tunnel. I do see people wanting to be uh, watching more faith-based uh, content. Mm -hmm. Also, aside from that, you've been really busy with pub being a public speaker and having five books. You also open a pizzeria. You have two locations. Uh, one's in Orange County, and where's the other one, or are they both in Orange well, County? Well, actually, we, the business has changed a little bit since mm -hmm. COVID came. We had a number of stores. We closed a number of them because when it, we, uh, we went in a different direction. We have something called a, a um, micro-vending machine, and our pizzas now are in these amazing vending machines that we're placing in various locations throughout the country, um, hotels and things like that. And the thing is that the pizza comes out of the machine as delicious as it came out of the oven. Some people say, Michael, come on, <laughs> you know, you're from Brooklyn, you're from New York. I'm telling you, it, it does. So we're having a lot of success with the vending machines. Um, and um, now we have, I, I can't mention what it is, but we have a kind of a game changing situation coming with our pizza, which is going to be available in um, a national chain store throughout the country. So. We're excited about that. We have frozen pizza now that we're putting into markets uh, nice. throughout the country. So the, 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 the business is growing. Perfect. We're, we're happy about it. And I'm also in the wine business, you know. Oh, so you went from slices and now for the wine, what would that be? Well, or are you just working with other companies? No, no, it's, it's a wine branded in my name. It's Franzese Wine, Michael Franzese Wine. And we've been in that now for about two and a half years. And we're in nine states now. We'll be in 12 by the end of the year. Uh, we're just distributing now in Australia, probably moving to the United Kingdom and um, enjoying it, you know, enjoying it and, you know, just keeping very busy. It's it's kind of my nature. You know, I've been entrepreneurial my, my whole life, so I enjoy doing that. But really, you know, my heart is in ministry and that's where I get the most satisfaction. And so I'll never give that up as long as the Lord allows me to continue. I will. I think, you know. I always believe that to those who have been given much, much is expected in return. The Lord has blessed me in many ways. I mean, just to be alive and to be free and to have a wife that I adore, we're going to, we'll be celebrating 39 years this year. Congratulations. So, thank you. Thank you. And, you know, children that I love, I have grandchildren that I love. So God has blessed me in many ways. Yes. And, and I could tell back. because you have um, scripture on your arms. Yes. You have a tattoo scripture on both arms. Well, you know, these, these two verses, and they're both from the book of Proverbs, had the most impact on me. Uh, they were the first verses that really struck me the first night I was put in solitary, when I thought my life was over. Because the government had told me, you'll never get out of prison again. We're going to indict you on another case. I mean, it was a bad night. And I started reading the Bible, 
And Proverbs 16, 7, which is the verse, because for some reason, the, the Bible just opened up to Proverbs, because I didn't know where to start. I never read the Bible. In Catholic school, you read the catechism. Mm -hmm. Priest reads the Bible from the pulpit on Sunday. You know, he reads the gospel. So it opened up to the book of Proverbs, and Proverbs 16, 7, when a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, mm -hmm. even his enemies are at peace with him. Well, I had nothing but enemies that mm -hmm. night on both sides of the law. And I was both encouraged and convicted in that verse because I said, yeah, okay, I married a Christian and girl. And interesting how it just opened up to that verse. It just opened up, you know, and I, I don't think it was a coincidence. As I think God knew that I was a guy that was, you, you know, you have to show me proof, show me evidence. And Proverbs is a brilliant book. I mean, Solomon, it doesn't matter what faith you are. Solomon was brilliant. You know, and so it really started to turn me on and give me some positive thoughts as I'm reading. And then that verse hits me and it, it really motivated to move on. And then I became um, I, I came to a verse that's been the verse of my life. And I think it all starts here. And that's Proverbs three, five and six. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. The trust is the word that got me because everything begins with trust in life. Lean not on your own understanding. Sometimes you just don't have the answers. I didn't have them that night. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And that's where it got to me and said, I'm your God. Pay attention. And then it said, and he will make your path straight. So I really analyzed each segment of that verse. And I started to really think about it. That's what led me to start to really get into my Bible. And the reason I have them here is because every morning when I brush my hair and I, I uh, brush my teeth, I don't want to forget. And I don't want to forget, so I keep it in front of me. And um, it's, been very, it's been very rewarding to me. Beautiful. I love that story. And it's something that, it, it's kind of like those miracle stories where you just open the Bible and, and it's God really speaks to you because he knows what you're going through. And there was your yeah. proof. Because you're, you're, like you mentioned, you're very analytical. You want to make sure that there's some truth behind what you're yeah. reading. So that's beautiful. Yeah, I was led to the verse right away that just made so much sense. You know, everything. It's such a, it's, Proverbs is such a wise book. Um, and I lead a lot of people. I mean, I love, I'm, a, I'm really more of a New Testament guy. I love the words of Jesus. I'm so inspired by Paul, you know, and what he went through and how God forgave him and used him in such a powerful way. And I bring that up all the time. People have, you know, said, well, you have a Paul story. It's, come on, mm -hmm. Paul is unique. Is unique, but it's to show you that you can be so far gone and God still can have a plan and a purpose for you and use you, forgive you your past and use you. And I always said, don't let your past define you. God says your current and your future is going to define you if you come towards him. And I've seen that so prevalent in, in not only my life, but others. And uh, it's very inspiring. But, uh, but Proverbs was the book that first attracted me to the Bible. Now, I know your website is michaelfrancis.com. And for everyone that's watching and listening, you can go to his website to see his upcoming events and also to buy his five books. Is there any other upcoming events you would like people to know? I know your movie is coming around the corner in a year or so if, I, if all goes well. And I'm rooting for uh, Leonardo DiCaprio to play you. That'd I'm sure great. any uh, actor would do a great job, but that would be pretty cool. <laughs> it would be cool. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a, a big presence on social media. I have a YouTube channel, just at Michael Francis. I'm now on Rumble, and I share a lot of my perspective on what's going on in the world and in this country in particular. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm on Instagram. You have to be on social media. Yes. I mean, and we've had a lot of success there. And uh, I have a lot of events coming up. I'll be speaking at a, a church in Houston in the next week or so. I'll be in Europe um, on a tour. Um, I think the 13th of this month I go there. Um, and I have many events coming up and, and just always staying active. I have another book in my head that I think I'm going to write. Uh, it's a faith-based book. And um, just moving forward with, with everything. And it's, uh, you know, it's great. I'm 73 years old. And it's great to have so much still ahead of me if God wants, you know. So many things going on. And I attribute that all to, again, God's having a different plan and purpose for my life than I intended for myself. So uh, it's all good. Thank you guys for tuning in. I'm your host, Yanitza Munoz. Thank you again, Michael, for taking the time for being here on the Christian channel. And thank you again for having me.
And for all of our listeners and viewers, check out our website at thechristianchannel.com.